And for that trip, we have. Uh, we have Carla. The, the, so I sent you my email. Oh, you're not. OK, I had an RFP drop that is due that day. OK, then so. now we have Commissioner McGrath. We have uh, Commissioner Garcia. We have Commissioner Beryl and we have Chair Cruz. Um, we also have both staff are going and additionally uh, we have eight Flagstaff artists that we're sponsoring. Oh, nice. So we're very excited about that. Great. And then on the 8th is our annual budget retreat. And this year we're meeting at Lowell Observatory. I suspect we'll get uh, more information as that date draws near. Um, any public participation? No, I received no inquiries. OK. So moving forward to the September minutes, did everybody have an opportunity to uh, read the September minutes? Is there any discussion? Um, any questions or comments about the September minutes? If there are none, then I'll entertain a motion to approve those as presented. Make a motion. Thank you, Carla. It's been moved and seconded um, to approve the September minutes as presented. All in favor say aye. 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 Anyone opposed? Anyone abstain? Thank you. The motion carries and the minutes are approved. Uh, moving forward to announcements. Yes, I have. Uh, I just wanted to tell you that I know we do usually a quarterly update on the work plan. I am going to just be mailing that out because both this uh, agenda and the November agenda are so very full, but it will be more of a bullet point about the progress that we've made on each project. And then I will be happy to end questions from individual commissioners that they have. Thank you. Is there another staff announcement? Um, just that we request that. Well, I did request that item H1 be taken before the action items, but that is the presenter is um, our coordinator for additional initiatives and she's not here. So if she's not present, we can't go forward with that one first. So we'll have to play it by ear when we get there. <laughs> OK, we can we can make the change when she um, shows up is that okay yes well that won't require a motion or anything right no okay um thank you chair and vice chair announcements i don't have any specific announcements uh vice chair do you have any announcements no thank you so i did just want to mention that we're um uh, proceeding with more progress on the country de hojo beautification um we had 56 volunteers show up on Saturday, and they were all inspired by the garden to show up, and then they beautified all the medians, um, oh, so cool. which was really amazing. Um, and then also cleaned out some fire hazard stuff, and uh, just generally, it was it was a pretty incredible thing to see. And that really started with the BIA grant, and uh, that momentum has really been incredible there. And to see people take personal responsibility and and really start to feel like they're stewards of the school is pretty awesome. And we had we uh, harvested uh, Hopi tea and uh, native corn and native beans this weekend, um, and had a lesson on how to use Hopi tea. Nice. Yeah, thank you for the pictures. Mm -hmm. uh, I, if I there had been time, I would have shared them. Mm. <laughs> but it was just it's really nice to see that momentum and what a BIA grant can do. Right. So that's wonderful. Thank so you. Thank you all for that. Are there announcements from other commissioners? I have a quick announcement. Uh, today is Indigenous Peoples Day. Uh, as many of you uh, may or may not know, Theatricos has launched a weeknight uh, movies. And uh, tonight, we, in honor of Indigenous Peoples Day, we are showing smoke signals. Oh, nice. Oh, awesome. Love, love that movie. <laughs> Rose just joined. Rose, Rose just joined. Okay. Thank you, Chris. Any other um, announcements from commissioners that are uh, online? All right, hearing none, we can um, we can decide to move forward with 
um, item H1, the new project for VPAC retreat consideration of Pueblo Navajo Code Talker 3D artwork. Rose, um, I know you just got here. Are you ready to go? Welcome, first and foremost. Thank you, everybody, and happy Indigenous yeah. Peoples Day. This one. You too, Rose. You too, Rose. And we Thank know you've you. had a busy day. <laughs> oh my goodness. Um, my car, my my truck is still packed with all kinds of stuff that I still have to bring in. <laughs> um, but yes, um, uh, I'll do my best to get um, to at least talk about some of the um, information regarding this project. And, and so you maybe all know about the El Pueblo Hotel Motel down the road and, um, and the condition that it's been in for several years now and how um, some of that has been hampered by COVID, the, the time with COVID. And so I think the owners are now, um, so let me back up and introduce myself first. <laughs> um, my name is Rose Tohi, and I am the coordinator for Indigenous Initiatives with the City of Flagstaff. And I have been with the city probably, well, Jana knows how long I've been here. <laughs> we're we, like we started we started on the same day. <laughs> yeah. We're we're like city birth sisters or something like that. <laughs> um, yes. Um, so we're we're twins in that way, and we we um, are so since then um, we so that's how long I've been with um, the city since 2020, um, and I really enjoy my my work here, and I really enjoy having to work with the different commissions as well, and um, thank you for inviting me to your agenda. So uh, back to um, the agenda item, and so. El Pueblo Hotel, is that hotel or motel? Motel. It's a motel. motel. Yes. Mm. Uh, Rose, the, um, all the commissioners have the background document. Uh, you know, they were sent that, so they do have that. Oh, great. That is very, very helpful. So you can tell with the, the information that's on there that there's a lot of work that needs to be done. Since the since the motel has been designated in some respect or another that it is a historic um, place building, that that's one of the the things that need to happen is to make sure that there's a declaration. And I know that Mark Rivas, our the person, um, our person with historic preservation, has been working with the owner to see if if that designation has been has been done. Um, and so I know there were a, a lot of different things that hindered things. And so I know that it it was getting back on track. So based on that, um, we also were came across the information that this is a hotel a motel that was used when the Navajo co-talkers were um, being recruited from Navajo Nation. And that this this motel is where they stayed, and that this is where they took um, a lot of time uh, talking about the plans of what needed to happen with uh, with them as they as they went into the Marines. And I I don't know everything about the history as far as that's concerned, but it is of very high interest to the Navajo Nation and the person who is um, in charge of working uh, on projects dealing with the Navajo Code Talkers. We, we've been sort of touching, uh, we missed him while he was in town, I think about a week or two ago, and he wanted to meet with us um, to, di to discuss more about what it is, what his vision would be, or what his um, uh, recommendations would be with this project. And so he really is uh, wanting to be involved and so that's where things are at right now. One of the things that we that we know for sure is that it, there's going to be like an interpretive wall, which will have information on the co talkers, what they've done. Um, there's going to be information on the code itself, and then also what 
what it is with the hotel, the history they had with the with the motel. And so that's all part of going to be, as far as I know, at least in the talking stages of this, that's going to be part of that wall. Um, <clears throat> there's also going to be, um, we also talked about um, maybe having some sort of art that is going to be public art that's going to be part of this project. And I know that when I first came on board, well, backing up to when um, the Indigenous Circle of Flagstaff had those forums, those community forums, one of the things that we really wanted to address was um, visibility. And that's where uh, um, the public art came in. And we wanted to have more public art that were in, that are inclusive of Indigenous people in this area. And so, well, Jana and her team just jumped on that and just made sure there was some, some money um, put aside for that. And and with your blessings, uh, the commission's blessings, that that's some of the things that we're working with right now. So anyway, back to that period of time is when we also started talking about maybe having a Navajo code talker um, public art of some kind, whether it be a, um, a, a, a you know, a big statue or some sort of something dealing with Navajo code talkers that we could that we could utilize with um, within our city um, that we can put out there as public art, but also tells a story about what that means to our country, not just for this this area, but for our country. So those are some talking points. And at that time, it was still a, a conversation when I first started working for the city. And now that this opportunity is sort of um, is sort of here with this historic building, with the hotel, and what it could mean to have um, more focus and highlight the Navajo Nation code talkers. Um, that was where where it's at right now. So just to give you a little bit of background on that, that's what I know. Now, as far as the historic preservation side, I know that Mark knows more about that. And um, unfortunately, he's traveling somewhere in Utah or something. And so I I tried calling him and texting him, and but I think he's out of range for whatever reason. Great. Yeah, we were okay. uh, ex expecting uh, Mr. Rivers to be here today, but we can catch up with him before the BPAC retreat. But my understanding from him is that there is going to be this courtyard uh, to this building and that it would be large enough to hold a 3D sculpture. And it, um, we had some preliminary discussions of the type of range. It could be not necessarily a person, but maybe, maybe some of the... Um, actual symbols that you know were used um you know it could be a range of things but it certainly has it'll have high visibility from route 66 and it will be the entryway of this you know new renovation obviously we need a lot more details uh you know as as we go forward but it's something that i thought was strong enough that i wanted to include in our retreat this year for discussion and, and possibly what year we might want to, you know, fund such a project. So, um, and I know Mark had a little bit, a few more visuals for us that he failed to share before he took off um, about what that courtyard might look at, but I'll, I'll try to have them ready for the retreat. <laughs> Do we know if um, anybody has had a conversation with Nava Singo, the owner? Um, about whether or not he's actually going to proceed with this. Mark has, and but I I would say that if the conversation is, are we going to add it? To I can it? speak to that. Can you? Yeah, I mean we are community development is in regular communication with Nava and his consultant about the projects that they are working on for. Um, the site, the first priority, of course, was to get the site secured and to make sure that uh, We lost you, Sarah. Oh, sorry.
hear me? Now we can. Okay, great. Sorry, last we spoke with Nava, which was about a month ago, he was fully intending to proceed with renovations and getting his plan submittals resent in so that we could start moving again. And what kind of time frame does he have? Do you know? You know, we never really know with the applicants at the community development counter. Um, we sure. continue to inform them of the deadlines and, you know, their consultants bring us applications when those are ready. So. Um, Okay. He had intended he it to be this fall. He intends also to do an update to the Heritage Preservation Commission this fall. Okay, thank you. No problem. Do we know if it's do we know if it's going to be um, so the document talks about some of the buildings um, could be demolished. Uh, there's room for additional new development. So do we know do we have a sense at all of what the what the overall site is going to look like in terms of either keeping what's there or tearing them down and putting something new up. Do we have do we have any sense of that? Anyone? Uh, there I do know and I heard directly from Nava that he has no intention of tearing down the two buildings that were apartments over the years. Unfortunately, the office building has been approved for a partial for a demolition and replacement with interpretive materials because there was serious structural damage that was not reasonable to ask him to repair due to somebody closing in previous dry rot instead of treating it appropriately. Yeah, and I believe um, uh, Mark Brothers said that uh, they're they're going to preserve a wall, but they can't preserve the rest of the building. Okay. Yeah, so they're only getting rid of the yeah. office. It's just what's on 66. Yes, and so the buildings that are sort of the mid range buildings, the two longer ones, those are both have been pretty much gutted, but uh, will be restorable. But the front building is the one that is not. And then the last application we saw from them, there was new development in the rear. Thank you. So this is just discussion item. Any other questions or comments? At this point. My my only comment is, is I would applaud uh, the project in general. The spirit of preserving that part of, of, of Flagstaff's history uh, and the code talker history and American history is is well worth us investing in preserving. Thank you. I would agree. I like the idea of uh, doing something with uh, BPAC on the site once plans become uh, more solidified and paperwork is submitted and all that sort of stuff. Right. And so hopefully we'll have an update at the retreat. Okay. Great, thank you. Rose, any final words? Are you still on the call? Yes, I'm still here. And um, I'm just going to tease Michael and say, Michael, can you please hurry up and um, approve this? <laughs> <laughs> yes, absolutely. <laughs> I know. Michael's like my little brother. I have to tease him. <laughs> thank you everybody i don't have any just that I'm, I'm really blessed to be here with you and um thank you for your time and i'm looking forward to working with all of you thank you rose thank you thank you rose so now we're going to move back up to action item g1 And so presenting on this is Sarah Dector, our comprehensive and neighborhood planning manager. And Sarah, the, um, the PowerPoint is up. Great, thank you, Craig, for sharing the PowerPoint today. Um, so I am here to, and I very briefly, I mean, three slides, make a presentation about renewing or repeating the effort that was made in between 2012 and 2014 to create cover art for the Flagstaff Regional Plan. So in about 2012, BPAC approved funding and did a call for artists 
um, for a new cover for the Flagstaff Regional Plan. Um, I think the second slide, if Craig can go to it, I can't, it's not the same screen Craig's sharing, so I'm not sure yeah. which slide he's on. We're on the second slide, Sarah. Great. Um, the this port this uh, painting was provided as the selected those, art. Those of us online, by the way, aren't seeing your second slide. Yeah, we're still seeing action item G one. I mean, oh, I have gotcha. it all separately, but gotcha. Yeah, we can pause for a second if you'd like to adjust. There you go. Thank you. Yeah. Sorry. So this painting was created by Bruce Aiken, um, who many of you know as an artist in our community. Um, he created it for the regional plan cover. He produced both graphic versions of this and there's actually a physical painting that hangs in the planning department. It's it spent some time in the lobby and it's moved around the planning department with um, mostly in my office and a few other spots over the years. Um, but this is sort of became internal facing art. Um, and so this time we are getting ready to start writing the regional plan and the draft regional plan, if I can stay on schedule, will go to the public for a 60 day review by next fall and the following year we'll get a final version that would need cover art like this or something that staff could produce internally. So um, I think the request from Jaina and myself is to consider if the $5,000 that would be kind of a maximum for producing something like this that's really representative of the community is something BPAC is interested in. And then also to hear any thoughts or feedback you have on um, what kind of procurement or other ideas about how we could go about this differently or maybe what we did well last time. And I think so that's I'll go all, ahead. all I have. I'll I was going to pass it to you, Jaina. Yeah, thank you, Sarah. We really haven't been able to determine exactly what the process was last time, but thinking through what we could do, um, this really depends on whether we want it just to kind of be a, like last time they did kind of just a beautiful flagstaff, you know, art piece, or if we want the artists to really work more hand in hand as they develop the plan with planning. Um, so those are some of the considerations. Um, so we could think of staff with input from BPAC doing just a limited invitational, or we could do an open call. Um, and we could either do that just based on qualifications and then let them develop the proposal along with the, um, the planning department as they attend some of those regional Many means as they're as they're writing it because they're writing it this spring, or we could actually have them kind of like the traffic signal cabinets just come forward with the proposal as part of the call. So we have a couple of different options, and so I was kind of wanting to hear, you know, your input before we you know went forward to deciding how to you know go forward and whether or not you want to approve this. Um, whatever the process is, because it's not a, it's a project that we have to fit in within this um, fiscal year in a work plan that's already very heavy. On the other hand, if we did an open call for proposals, we could possibly tie it in at the same time as the traffic signal cabinets. You know, uh, at least like the, it's kind of a two dimensional art. There's a lot of relationship there with the kind of art that we're, seeking although if we seek for them to go along with planning it's you know it's a little bit different but we could put it out at the same time so that we do all the outreach at the same time so that we're not you know doing a whole separate you know plan i know that sarah and i have already discussed uh you know who could be on the selection panel she's got a committee we would obviously ask for two DPAC members to be part of that selection panel. And then Sarah has uh, people who've been working on the regional plan that she would draw from for the rest of the panel. So she would work with us. She would be an extra hand in helping with staff time. I have a clarifying question. So the options are to approve the Aiken painting 
or to go out? No. Or, okay, that was just a mock up? The Aiken painting was from the last regional plan. Oh, okay. that's what we did in the past. Okay, okay. That's a piece okay. of art that BPAC funded. I I think we determined it was in like the 2012 BPAC budget or 2013, FY 2013. But it's, um, and the art that is produced this time could be very different. We have been including art as a um, tool for engagement throughout this process. So we have all the materials that people left with us from the art boxes, which we've been using at events throughout the community to discuss the regional plan. And we have some other visual representations for, that have come from the public through our participatory process that could be shared with an artist that might be interested in producing this. We also will have some visualization from our scenario planning that could lead to something very futuristic as opposed to something that looks, you know, like a painting in an art gallery. So there's a lot of opportunity for this to both be very interesting and inclusive, and also um, it can look very similar or very different. I think that's that's something staff is very open to hearing feedback on. I will remind the fact that Sonia London Hall was the artist who created those art boxes. Um, and so that was approved by BPAC and you know, that was a very successful tool. If you remember, we I think it was a year ago, August, we had our own session here with one of the boxes. Um, and so that's where all these visualizations, as Sarah has referred to, has come from. So you're asking for either a limited invitation or an open call. Is that what you're asking for specifically? No, what I'm asking for specifically for BPAC is to give input on what they see as a good process. It would, you know, ultimately be for staff to, to carry, to decide okay. with, um, um, with uh, community develop with planning. Um, but what I need, what I'm asking BPAC is to approve this as a project. Oh, okay. For you, FY23. You said, yeah. <laughs> yeah. I got nothing. I want to just thank uh, Sarah just for including BPAC in the process and being so receptive to the art boxes to begin with. And to kind of nudge us in a direction by giving us an open mind of um, the possibilities of the art that's being created currently in within the community, um, which gives me pause to think that having the more limited call might be better. But if it's going to add more to staff time, I think that the um, the committee surrounding it could could um, could be the one that kind of steers the direction of the art. So uh, what like, I think it's what's best for staff at this point, especially when it's all crammed into this year. Yeah, that was going to be my question is, which is the least commitment for staff time, the open call or the limited call? They, they each would have you so, know, difficulty with, at different points of, of, yeah. of the process. And so that's why I think ultimately it has to be a staff decision with um, with, with planning, just determining where they are um, in the spring with their um, actual planning process. Um, and that's why I, I want your input and what your ideas are so that I can carry them forward. Um, you know, but it's, you know, I think that it's not as heavy of a lift because once the artist is chosen, um, it's, it, it's minimal staff time. Minimal staff time. It's 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 more like the traffic signal cabinets. Okay. It really is. Uh, and then are we doing an either or in terms of the funding? And where the funding is gonna go or is this funding we just need to approve it as a project for under five thousand dollars. What? Sarah has her hand up. Yes, Sarah. Mm -hmm. I, I also yeah. wanted to point out because Anthony um, Commissioner Garcia did not that he's actually going to be both he's going to be serving on the regional plan committee as well the one that's actually reviewing and writing the are reviewing the portions of the plan that we're writing and sending to them for feedback so um, you know I think he's. I, I hate to volunteer you, Commissioner Garcia, but you seem a very good fit for maybe being on the selection committee for a project like this too. Just nudge, nudge. 
I was just hoping you were going to ask me to recuse myself right now, Sarah, but thank you. But, but thank you all. No, absolutely, absolutely but. not. You can weigh in. <laughs> Commissioner Barrow, do you have a question or comment? Uh, both. Um, what's the budget? And I know on, on the proposal it says under 5,000, but that's that's a broad range. Um, and that it just uh, completely depends on whether or not we end up wanting an independent artwork in addition to the digital file. It's to be that's to be determined. I can't completely answer that for you, Commissioner Vero, right now. Uh, if we, uh, you know, if it ends up being a separate painting that we're also purchasing, it's going to be more than if it's just a um, an art file that's handed over. So. First of all, I'm all, all in favor of, of some original art on this. I, I would be cost conscious. I know that that budget constraints aren't necessarily our biggest constraints, but but still, I, I think that we should be cost conscious about it. Um, and as for whether it's a limited or open invitation, I'd say whichever it's a small enough project that whichever is easiest and more efficient for staff would be a good idea. Thank you, Chris. Any other comments from folks online? If not, can I entertain a motion to um, ask staff to move forward with this project? Yeah, I'd like to make a motion um, to have staff uh, move forward with this project and first consider the um, the limit out the limited call. Thank you, Anthony. Any seconds? I'll second it. Thank you, Carla. It's been moved and seconded to uh, allow staff to proceed with um, a selection process for art for the regional plan uh, as long as it's under $5,000. Uh, all in favor say aye. Can, can I amend that? Can I amend that to, to add to, to Commissioner Garcia's proposal a reminder to be cost conscious? Uh, in addition to the under 5,000 or? Yes, in addition to the under 5,000. 5,000 is a, a pretty penny for this kind of art. Um, okay. I'm not saying you shouldn't do that, but I'm saying that that it's something that 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 we should be paying attention to the cost. Okay, Anthony, do you want to amend your motion? I don't remember which this one was. So just to um, approve the project for staff, moving forward as long as they are uh, cost conscious. And first consider a re, uh, the, 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 limited the, 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 invitation. The focus. Consider, first consider. Is it, was, did I ca Perfect. capture your words perfectly? Okay. I'll second. Thank you. So it's been moved and seconded to um, approve this um, as a project for staff as long as, or with the consideration that it be a uh, limited invitational and that staff be cost conscience for uh, art project that is under $5,000. All in favor say aye. 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 Anyone opposed? Anyone abstain? The motion carries and staff has a new project. <laughs> Thank Moving you forward. Thank you. Thank you. Moving forward to the art wrap for a public toilet in Heritage Square. Leave it to Parks and Rec to bring to you a toilet. Uh, <laughs> to consider. It's just not online yet. Give me one second. I will get this online. I'm Rebecca Sayers. I'm the Parks, Recreation, Open Space, and Events Division Director. Thank you for having us today. We meet with Jana and her team quarterly to talk about um, areas that our programs or sections overlap or opportunities that one of us might be able to present to the other. So in a recent conversation, this came up. This is a project that um, we lovingly call ourselves pros. That's Strike open space and events. And um, there's a need to, and our commission, our Parks and Recreation Commission, has prioritized the need for a new toilet in the Heritage Square area. Right now, we have um, some toilets in the back of that alley. 
that are um they leave a little bit to be desired right like i can't imagine many locals uh use those so the idea is to replace those with uh something that is um, that better meets the community's needs and is frankly a little more out in the open. And um, the toilet itself is more open to deal with some of the unwanted behaviors that we see happening in those alley restrooms. So this is an idea that we're looking at. Um, it's called the Portland Blue. This was actually developed by a company in Portland for the city of Portland, who is dealing with many of the same issues that we are in the restrooms that we have downtown. So you'll see just some of the identifying features. Um, it's a small footprint, which is nice. It's all fully self-contained, um, but it's open vented on the top and bottom so that if there's more than one person or there's someone laying on the ground, police department is able to identify if there might be a challenge and it also just it's private but it feels a little more open so that it curbs some of the unwanted behaviors that we see in the alley restrooms so if we could go to the next slide please this um while developed in portland they're now um in 90 locations across the u.s including in mountain towns with freezing temperatures like we have. That's probably a question that first comes to mind, right? They figured out how to um, keep it heated, keep the water from the water lines from freezing, et cetera. Those are all uh, options that we're able to add on. So the intended location, as I said, is in, uh, we hope, in Heritage Square. That's the idea is to keep rest a restroom in that same area and be able to close the uh, restrooms that are in the alley um, and even turn that space back over to the building owner, which is the Hobie tribe. Um, the opportunity that we're talking to you all about is not necessarily whether you like a restroom in Heritage Square or not, although that's part of it. Um, but as you saw, with that previous photo, there might be an opportunity to beautify that with some sort of wrap. And so, if we go to the next slide, you can get a, a good understanding. Um, so this is a Portland Blue located in Arvada, Colorado, so also a, a colder climate. Um, but you can see that there are several panels available that would um, be available for some sort of art wrap. Similar, what Jana and I were thinking was similar to the utility boxes projects that you guys are working on. Um, so if we go to the next slide, our original intent was to um, put this up in, in the planter that's um, that kind of by the dumpsters. That's what we are hoping for. Um, I did just get some information from Amy last week. She started going through our inner division design or our, yeah, our design review service, basically uh, internal city staff. And there might be some fatal flaws with that location. So it might have to move to somewhere else on the square, uh, maybe a little closer to the Hopi building itself in order to get utilities. Uh, but that's that's the intent is that it would be still close to the alley back in that area, not like out in the middle of the square at the at the bowl of the amphitheater or anything, but um, a little more it, the, the full the whole intent is to put this a little more out in the open. Um, and so if you go to the next slide. Here is an example where there's, this one has been wrapped on the interior. We have that opportunity as well. Um, and the audience that would see this or use this, as you know, is, is tourists, locals, pretty much everybody that goes through Heritage Square um, is gonna have an opportunity to experience this. And so, you know, some other considerations are, 
the historic nature of downtown. How can we help this fit in a little bit better than a stainless steel um, icon <laughs> in the middle of the square? Um, but all of that is where we were hoping that um, Jana and you all can help us make it look a little bit better. So that's the opportunity. And um, in our early meeting, I did discuss uh, with Rose that this would very easily just fit into the traffic signal cabinet call. It would just be an additional location. It is a little bit more of a you know complicated piece and that it's almost like a panorama on the outside and the inside. So we would probably have a larger artist fee than um, the other ones, but it would be, you know, probably the same vendor um, and it would, it could easily go into the same call. But they and an opportunity to have that new canvas style canvas. New style canvas in the call. So, yes, yeah, so this one goes, it dovetails right in. So it's a little bit actually even easier in that way. We have, um, have there been examples of fully mounted versions? You know, Amy was is not she's on vacation today. Amy again is our consistent parks and rec director, um, and she's done a lot of the research on this. I'm guessing so, especially given that interior wrap. I don't see why I wouldn't, but uh, I haven't seen one. Okay. We could certainly consult with the vendor that we've used and ask the vendor if he foresees any problems because we did have a problem at the East Library with the bench wrap. It peeled off. So um, obviously even if you approved it and um, you know we found out that there was that problem, we would obviously abort. <laughs> um, but um, I don't this seems like a very similar material in steel. That was a kind of a plastic bench and so therefore the the it didn't stick very well yes i uh, just looked up the portland moo and they actually advertised that it can be wrapped in vinyl to show artwork or advertisements but you should always consult with your local lots <laughs> google did too and the question that came up is why is the portland Lou so expensive <laughs> <laughs> what were you going to say i'm sorry oh, no. yeah i know some sectors require they do the wrap um, because uh, of warranty issues with the all coming together. Um, but I think the wrap's a great idea to make it blend into the square. I'd be really in favor of having it on the interior and exterior. I think um, ha having that patterning instead of blank material would just give it some longevity um, and both for the wear it's going to get. Um, I also think. Um, yeah, I'm, I'm glad to see. Uh, yeah, uh, the the safety measures on it do seem really well thought through for public space and would be um, a great amenity to have a safe, accessible uh, restroom in that area. So, it's overall in, in favor of it. Yeah, who cares it? <laughs> it's it's great. I you know it's funny because those restrooms in the alley they. They forgot to have the toilets for the downtown mile this year. So they didn't bring them until the parade. So there were hundreds of runners that were very nervous running around downtown looking for bathrooms. And I saw a lot of public space violation. <laughs> and it, those poor bathrooms were. That's good to know for my events. Had. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that was no good. But it, I see a lot of that stuff anyway. It would be nice if there was an open and accessible. I don't think a lot of people know those alley bathrooms are there. You know, if you're new to town or if you haven't been in Flagstaff for a long time, those are kind of a mystery. And like, they, they are, and then when you walk up to them, they look they're pretty bad. Yeah. I've lived here my whole life. I've never seen them. I don't know anything about them. They're probably like up next to one, but I've never been to one. I don't even know where they're at. I think so it's I a, get it. Yeah, no, it's a great idea. And Speaking as one of those runners, like I've used that bathroom and it's grim. <laughs> <laughs> Any questions or comments from folks on the line? Hey, uh, first I'll just say I'm, I'm glad Anthony said he had no idea where they were because I'm sitting here listening to this conversation and I'm thinking the exact same thing. I was like, I had no idea these toilets, these alley toilets that we're talking about even existed. 
Um, but uh, going to what Claire said about uh, supporting uh, doing something on the inside and the outside, I agree with that uh, completely. Mm -hmm. And then also wondering if it could potentially be two separate opportunities. Uh, it doesn't need to be the same artist doing the same thing on the inside and the outside. Uh, probably want them to tie in together a little bit, but it could also be uh, it's pretty distinct experience uh, being on the inside of that compared to just, the, you know, the thousands of people who are going to see it from the outside. Um, and it could be a little bit different inside. So just, you know, not overcomplicate it, but it could be two separate ideas and experiences for people. Thanks. Good points, Matt. Thank you. Anything else? Are we ready to entertain a motion? Before we have a motion, I just wanted to thank Parks for coming into our meeting, and I hope that in the future, whenever you need us, we're right here for you. We want to work with other commissions as much as possible, and if on bigger projects, that means that we have to collaborate as uh, you know a dual uh, commission meeting. Um, I think that that would be a good for all of us. Thank you. That would be awesome. Is there a motion, folks, to um, approve an art wrap for the Heritage Square public toilet? As an FY24 project. Thank you. <laughs> I saw that. I just didn't say it. I'll make a motion to I'll, approve that. I'll second Thank that. You, Carly. Thank you, Matt. It's been moved and seconded to approve um, an art wrap for the Heritage Square public toilet as an FY24 project. All in favor say aye. 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 Anyone opposed? Anyone abstain? The motion carries. Thank you, folks. Thank you so much. Moving forward to um, our proposals for Indigenous representation. Kristen. Does that remote work? It does. Okay. Oh, sorry. Stand up. Okay, so this afternoon I'm here to um, present the selection process for the Indigenous and Multicultural Representation Project, project me, as well as the five finalists and two alternates that were selected by our 10 member selection panel. So just briefly, this is what I will be discussing today from the outreach um, through to the criteria for scoring artists. And then finally, we'll take a look at the images of the finalists, the, art, the images of the artwork of the finalists, as well as the alternates. So this was a national um, call, but very much with a regional focus. And um, we received 14 proposals from 11 applicants. And we did a lot of targeted marketing um, to artists uh, within the Colorado Plateau um, and the Southwest. But again, we took our um, marketing to California and to New York as well. So here is just a brief summary of what we did. Um, we had targeted emails. We had social media features from our arts partners. Um, we were featured in their um, weekly or monthly emails to their artists and constituents. And then we did some good old fashioned um, guerrilla marketing as well by attending the Tuba City Flea Market and the Gallup market and passing out um, information as well as the call to participating vendors there. So here's a little bit about the um, Elizabeth Lizzie Archuleta County Park. This park has a history. It um, was one of Flagstaff's first sawmills. It attracted indigenous, Mexican, African-American, Swedish and Polish families to work the mills. It is frequented by individuals and families of the nearby Coconino County Juvenile Court 
and Coconino County Detention Facility. It is enjoyed by neighboring residents, and any students, young professionals, um, residents who reside within the historic Southside community, and also visitors near and far who enjoy the recreational and environmental opportunities of the park. So there are five sculpture pedestals located along an art walk in this park. They are designated um, by the yellow circles um, on the image um, at the left. And then the middle and far right images are examples of what those sculpture pads look like. And we included all of this information in our call to artists. Again, this project has a vision. Um, we are looking for proposals for large scale artworks for a temporary exhibition from May through October of next year. And these can be for existing or newly created artworks. And the ownership is retained by the artists. The artwork must be suitable for exterior locations. And of course, Flagstaff's weather. The artworks will reflect and make visible aspects of indigenous and other diverse cultural representation, including Black and Latinx or Latinx art. And this can be done through a variety of ways. We've really left it up to the artists. And the proposal, proposals you will see today are quite innovative and original. Um, they're fantastic, as you will see. And so we are hoping that um, this becomes um, well, it will become an annual exhibition, but we're hoping that it really puts this park on the map in terms of public art um, and it becomes an outdoor sculpture venue in Northern Arizona. So the maximum amount that each artist can receive for um, their proposal is $20,000. And this includes, um, excuse me, this must cover all of their expenses. And the artists, as you will see, delineated their expenses in their respective proposals. And here is the evaluation criteria that the selection panel utilized um, to help them decide which um, artists would be the finalists and which artists would be um, alternates. 30 points for suitability and durability of the artwork, and also the utilization of vandalism resistant materials. And then 30 points for originality. So we know that art is subjective, that is why we have selection panels, but essentially we want to know um, if the selection panelists like the artwork, if it spoke to them, if they thought it was good. And then 40 points. How well the proposed artwork um, functions not only independently, but collectively with respect to the other artworks also selected. And um, one more thing too, the artworks don't have to relate, but they do have to work together in space. I'm sorry, can you see? Okay. I have a quick question about this slide. And um, it's just kind of a silly question. <laughs> when it says reflect cultural visibility, um, is there a better way to say that? Because I get a little confused by that. Or am I the only one? I could be the only one. So how well did the, the proposed functions with the other selected artworks reflect cultural visibility? And that goes back to the vision. Okay, wait. When Do you, you remember that? I was able to hear it. Thank you. Okay. Thank you, guys. So again, we had 10 selection panelists. Um, we wanted to make sure that um, there was representation from all of um, Flagstaff and Coconino counties um, committees um, and councils, and we did have that here. And this is our estimated schedule and next steps. So. Today, BPAC, uh, we are seeking BPAC approval. Um, we have notified the artists um, already. And then the next steps would be to 
um, go ahead and draft um, those contract offers. Again, we're looking at an installation um, in April and then a tentative opening May 4th with the exhibition running through October. And here are our five finalists. And again, we'll be going through um, each of these in more detail and showing visuals for you as well. So first up is Lance Gazi. I have a quick question. Uh, how many uh, people were there to choose from? Or were, did you guys just have five it, to choose from? It was, it was um, in an earlier slide, and it, there was 11 applicants and 14 proposals. So Lance is a, a, a Danette artist. He resides in Chuba City. And he is his proposal was for newly created artwork um, that <clears throat> represents the Navajo tree of life, but also would include some geometric patterning as well of storm clouds and rain. And um, he really wants to represent his culture and show that style of art as well as um, reflect um, its matriarchal society. This is Lance's budget. And here are a few examples of his past artwork. And this is a rendering of his proposed artwork. So to get, again, it is the tree of life weaving in stone. Um, it will stand approximately six feet tall and three feet wide. It is one foot in thickness and it weighs almost one ton. And just to give you an idea, it'll be similar um, in shape to this sculpture here. I have a quick question. So, um, you know, I was on the on the committee and I reviewed all these and scored them. But something just occurred to me in the budget of 195. It talks about um, its cost for installing. So do these people know that they're also financially responsible for deinstalling, especially this one that weighs so much in yes. terms of yes. a crane or whatever? Mm -hmm. okay. Yes, because I didn't see that in the budget. So I right. just uh, yes. Yeah. Okay. They do know. Okay. <laughs> they be made aware. Okay. <laughs> and hopefully they became that. But yes. And, and in the contracting process, we'll be refining that scope of work. Okay. Next up is Olivario Balsells. And um, Olivario is a public artist. He resides in Phoenix. And so he actually has two artworks that have been um, recommended for this exhibition. The first is entitled Bluebird, and it features um, an image of a hummingbird, which in Mesoamerican culture um, is very important and um, within his Mexican culture as well. This is the budget for that um, loaned artwork. And this is an example of his previous artworks. A little bit more information about Bluebird. It's four feet wide by four and a half feet high, and it weighs approximately 180 pounds. Only 180? That's a lightweight. Yeah, it's a lightweight <laughs> compared to a ton, yeah. Compared to a ton, yes. <laughs> Next up, we have Gideon Dianongo, and he is um, an artist originally from Zimbabwe, but he resides in Phoenix. 
He um, has two artworks, um, one which has been um, recommended for the exhibition and one that you'll see later that is an alternate piece. Um, the first one here is entitled Reflection on the Past and the Future. This is Gideon's budget. Here is a little bit more information. It's 70 inches tall, 15 inches wide, and 8 inches in diameter, and it weighs 108 pounds, and it is hand-carved opal stone. Next, we have Anouk Allroots and Reggie Fitchett. And Anouk and Reggie are local Flagstaff artists. Their proposal um, is entitled Goddesses, and it features four divine goddesses, each aligned with the cardinal directions. And um, there includes four, or there are, excuse me, four steel um, fabricated windows in which, and in each of those windows, um, one of the goddesses will reside. So there will be east, every, east representation, west representation, north representation, and then um, south representation. And this is the budget. This is a very abbreviated budget. It was much more detailed in the proposal. And this is um, an example of the type of um, welding that um, the artists do, Reggie in particular. Um, this is an example of that. A little bit more information about the sculpture. It will stand seven feet tall with a three and a half foot Base supporting four outward facing frames or windows. This is a bird's eye view of the piece itself. And again, the four um, windows along cardinal directions. And a little bit more detail in this rendering, you'll see each of the windows holding one of those goddesses. The second work by Olivario Balsells. This is actually for a newly created um, artwork. It will be called Eagle Sun. And like hummingbirds, eagles are very important in both Mexican and Mesoamerican culture. Olivario's budget for this artwork. It'll be fabricated from aluminum and steel. It'll stand six feet um, in height and it'll be six feet wide. And this one will weigh 370 pounds. So here is a rendering or series of images of what the artwork will look like. Based on scoring, we have two alternates, um, Gedeon Nianongo and then Hector Ortega. This is Gideon's um, second proposal. It is entitled At Peace with Life. And so this is also a proposal for um, a loaned artwork. This is his budget. That piece with life is approximately 44 inches in height um, and it weighs 85 pounds and again hand carved spring stone. And here's an image of that sculpture. And then 
Hector Ortega is a public artist who resides in Phoenix, and he um, is proposing a large scale but contemporary aesthetic for his sculpture. It's entitled Loise, and it is in tribute to Cesar Chavez, who um, was um, an important labor leader and civil rights activist. And he hopes that it um, inspires others to achieve their dreams. This is Hector's budget. And here are a few examples of his past artwork. And here is um, an example of the proposed piece. It would stand 11 feet tall and it would weigh approximately 900 pounds. And again, this is for a newly created piece. Questions or comments? Um, I just wanted to make a quick comment to staff. Um, I was really impressed with the, um, the, the reception of calls for this project and all the other ones. Um, seeing how much we used to struggle in the past and getting people to sign up for things. I think Eliza kind of um, laid the groundwork, but thanks to you, Jenna, I think that we're really, really seeing a nice amount of answers to the call, and I appreciate that. I was wondering, like, what is the cost benefit for the rental portion of it? Like, are we basically funding their creation of these projects or are they much more expensive than just how much we're renting them for the short period of time? One more time. Sorry. Are we, Why are we renting them rather than purchasing outright? Sort, yeah. sort of. I understand why we're not, but I just, I'm just wondering about the cost benefit. I'll go ahead. I mean, this was envisioned as a you know, temporary exhibition, yeah. and it was a, a hope again of establishing, as said, this as a you know, the flex actually comes a place known for these types of art. So, we, in order to attract, you know, perhaps even having art galleries and art museums, bonus pieces, is that is our hope also in the future. Um, you know, the budgets had to be reflective of that. Um, and, you know, so that's why we said you could create it for the space, but you own it and you can even, you know, sell it later, you know, you can sh you know, show it or it can be an existing piece and hopefully it's an existing piece of, you know, a level, um, that is something that, you know, everybody would want to have as part of an exhibition. So it really was, it had that idea in mind of getting, um, even like art galleries representing some big name artists ultimately interested and involved in this in, in this endeavor and really putting um, this uh, park as you know a place that it gets known for this. So this is our first, yeah, the first outreach. And I think we've been we were very happy with the response. There was a couple of art galleries and stuff we'd hoped to capture that we didn't quite capture this time, but we will um hopefully you know, got them in the next round and uh, getting, you know, an international artist from Zimbabwe, it was kind of a, an important uh, thing to try to do. And how did you come up with the metric? Kind of just, like, the as a, it was just a bit based on past experience. Cool. Yeah, that's all I did. Yeah. Then I was also wondering if you could put that sort of thing to like the advertisement for our ads. But it should be displayed at that same time. We use it as one of the I've been in discussions with Julie Sokol about how to actually have a, a, a talk and an exhibition uh, as part of Artex for, for this project. Yes. And Heidi has a comment. She said the last piece looks very similar to the piece at the airport. Just an observation. Yes. <laughs> yes, we know. <laughs> Any other questions? Um, I have just a comment. I think, first of all, th this is all all wonderful. It's a, it's beautiful stuff. And uh, this commission's heard me talk about having art that relates to each other. Um, but what would that be? I think the process for getting this art and the results 
bear this out, that some of this process and this art at some point could could be could be a style or an image or a spirit that that uh, carries through more than just these pieces of art. And maybe not these specific pieces, but I think there's a beginning of a process here for for moving in that direction. Thank you, Chris. Claire? Yeah, um, so I think the, I'm really excited about the pieces that were chosen. And um, I have one question since there was one artist that was left at twice, and both artworks are wonderful, but the there was an artist that wouldn't have been repeated that was just three points less. So I was curious if there was any discussion about that on the selection committee or, you know, maybe if there's a bigger picture about three. Yeah, yeah and, and it, you know, we, not knowing how many people would actually respond to this call, we did allow for two proposals per person. We don't have to do that in the future, but we were very uncertain about the response we we're gonna get. But as far as the number of points, um, that is a strict procurement process okay. and uh, the highest scores prevail so they, they could not be that further discussion okay my procurement officer right. sitting right over here <laughs> and he likes and he likes my answer yeah. <laughs> <laughs> did you have something else to say i i do um First of all, let me let me say again how much I love not just this art, but the process that got us here. Um, but I've got a little bit of a sensitive question and I can't not ask it. How confident does the selection committee feel that the artists will be able to deliver on their proposals uh, to a degree that will do the city proud? I think that's a, a answer, Chris, that we have to ask about any uh, you know, project that we um, you know hire an artist for, and uh, that is why you know past you know um, past features were also included so that people could have an idea if they um, pulled off you know pieces of this size or portion you know in the past and some of these are, are existing pieces and therefore they could see that they were you know already done and and they could judge them for themselves actually that's something we don't usually get to do uh selection panels don't get to see completed projects to to choose from um but as far as things like the installation and if they need assistance in installation or um, structural engineering staff will work with them and provide additional support if they need it. Great, I'm, I'm answer to the question, Jenna, but I think he was also asking the selection panel too. Right? Well, I was just gonna say, this was definitely discussed, Chris, and, and there were um, certainly artists within the submittals that inspired less confidence as to their ability to deliver. Um, and that certainly, I mean, for me, I know there was one one particular piece that I felt just wouldn't be robust in the park and could potentially be damaged upon impact. And I, I felt that that was, a, that was an issue with that particular one. So if somebody decided to hit it with a rock or something like that, it could be destroyed. Um, it seemed delicate to me. But, uh, you know, and th there were conversations about Installation and and how are we going to install these things and how are we going to prevent children from being crushed by one ton sculptures and those were all considerations. I, it's I also one of the, and Chris, I, it's one of the it's one of the criteria also the materials and viability. I understand that and I appreciate both your answers. Let me let me still try to be sensitive and be a little less opaque. Um, I had occasion to deal with one of the artists selected. The proposal was selected. The execution was not well received. And that, that's the reason why I ask. So if you're all confident, I'm going to, uh, to trust your judgment. I think with any amount of confidence, there's also that theory based where you, when you throw numbers into the equation, there's going to be X amount that doesn't crown out in the finish regardless of the proposal. 
Um, I do trust these panelists in particular uh, to use the best of their ability to kind of, uh, you know, kind of read between the lines at times. Uh, at, as BPAC commissioners, we tend to do a lot of jurying. And after a while, you kind of get it down to a science to where you can kind of just see what's going to work and what's not. Um, but we do have that, you know, I don't know what the percentage would be in theory, but we do have that percentage where it's not going to work all the time. I just hope it's not on this project. I'm with you, Chris. Good question. Thank you. Thank you, Chris. Any other comments from folks on the line? And one more slide, but there we go. If there are no other questions or comments, I'll entertain a motion to approve the five finalists and the two alternate alternates who were presented tonight for the Liz Archuleta Park. Motion to approve. Is there a second? It's been moved and seconded to approve the five selected artists and two panelists for the Liz Archuleta Park. All in favor say aye. 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 Anyone opposed? Anyone abstain? The motion carries and the artists are approved. Thank you, Joyce. Nice Thank job. you. Does anybody need a snack? <laughs> yes, can I have a yeah. snack, please? <laughs> I know. So, so next on the agenda is a uh, discussion about our BPAC meeting location. The options are to uh, remain in this room or to uh, move to council chambers. Yeah, my recap is very brief. Uh, Commissioner Garcia uh, asked us to, to consider this um, to have the future, you know, BPAC meetings uh, in chambers, um, as was done before the pandemic. We held a meeting in chambers so people could experience that again, uh, especially commissioners who had not. Uh, we know uh, we have extensive experience now with meeting in this room, so we didn't, uh, you know, need to review that one in particular. So it's just a uh, something we mission to discuss and to decide. Any discussion folks on meeting location? For some uh, uh, with the AV set up and I like to take notes on my computer and like I have a plug and but it's a little bit um, it's just a little bit more accessible for me, just um, having experience both now, but it's, it's just my events. I'm typically coming here after a seven to four workday, and I, I would feel weird about having snacks all over the um, dais in the chambers. Um, I, I think the discussion is nicer here, and we're able to be a little more collegial in this room. I don't know if you see how I'm sitting right now, but this is literally how I have to look around the meeting. And then when we're when we have a discussion, like a presenter, and then their slide and the thing, and then back over here, this isn't about me. This is about the public. So I watch about twenty to twenty-four different commission meetings per month. But I do at my other job. Don't tell them. And uh, this little guy spinning around to the point where you know you get motion sickness watching him now in that room for me when i watch the meetings from planning and zoning for instance who consume that room um some of the other commission meetings as well as the council i watch those two from time to time um you're able to get a clear view of what's going on and you're able to hear everybody and here you can't and you don't know what's going on on the on the TV. Now I understand there's the argument that the public doesn't care or whatever, but I wouldn't be here if it wasn't for public participation. And maybe it maybe we should keep the meetings in here just because of that reason only. I'm joking. <laughs> but for the public consumption, and not only that, I uh here it is it is nice to be able to like be sit a little bit closer and I guess 
not have to worry about that public eye on you to discuss things, but it was so much quieter that meeting that we had. We had deliberate conversations through that silence, through that quietness. And I would hope that, um, you know, moving forward, we would be able to continue having that deliberate conversation in that space that was created to have these type of focused conversations, even by the design, by the way the things, you know, the triangle of the, the matrix, the architects, they thought about this for these type of meetings. We do move tons of money around. We are an important commission. And around this table, I just have a hard time. Like, I don't know, I kind of like it because I get to move around a lot. But really, to like look at what everybody's doing and then also looking at the screen and stuff like that, I feel like sometimes I feel a little confused by it all. But there, it's all directly in front of you. And when you hit that mic, what they hear is what's coming onto that mic. They don't hear all this gibberish and papers flying around and they're like side conversations. And because I noticed that in the other meetings too when I'm watching it. And it's it's hard. It's so hard to watch, first of all. The other meetings that are in this room, it's so hard. You can't keep up with it. Um, but also, when when um, when I have come to the other commission meetings to sit in, it I feel really out of place as a public participant. There, I know where my place is. Here, I'm just kind of like on the side. I'm hoping they remember me. I'm standing, you know, at the other committee meetings that I've had in this room. Um, and I think it. I think just for those those reasons of, of, of public consumption and, um, you know, what is being said on the mic. I like to have side conversations that aren't always picked up, you know, uh, when I'm not pushing that button, just like, I don't know, your hair looks nice today, Carla, or something like that. <laughs> but it's something that doesn't need to be in this meeting with this poor little robot guy doing circles. I don't know if anybody's ever watched one of these meetings, but it's not conducive to anything you'd want to continue to watch. I hear what you're saying. I, I mean, personally, I have watched meetings with the owl and um, followed quite well. And I just want to state that I would never want to hold a meeting to deter public. I would definitely want them to come. <laughs> so I, I just want to make that be transparent about that. Um, so, um, but yeah, I, I certainly hear your perspective as well. For sure. And I agree with you that the public participation is important, but one of the things about planning and zoning is, I don't know if you guys have ever seen their homework. Um, I mean, they've got so much pre-reading and so much work that they do prior. But I really feel like our approach in BPAC, because it is an artistic sort of methodology, like part of what we're doing in here is workshopping and, and having a conversation as a group um, I, I found that that part of BPAC to be pretty inhibited in the council chambers. I didn't feel like I could workshop something, you know, and, and it was harder to read fellow commissioners, harder to see, you know, what staff wanted, like just in terms of like faces. And um, for me, it's that collegial approach is a part of what I think may, has made BPAC so strong over the last couple of years. Um, and I, I worry that if we move into a, like a PNZ format, that really what we're going to do is we're going to become more like, regimented and, and maybe a little less able to flow and, and converse. And I, I worry about losing that in, in the beautification. And as far as the public participation goes, um, I mean, there's very little public participation in any of Flagstaff's commissions except for PNZ. Um, every once in a while, you'll see people show up for historic, but that's only because they've got a facade they want to grant for. But it's um, at the same time, I would like to welcome the public to come into a, a collegial conversation and see that it's this rather than, you know, people kind of. I, I, do you remember the? kids that showed up that wanted to do the Black Lives Matter stuff on Route 66 and, and they wanted to do the big the big graphic on Route 66 and the net result of that conversation was guys we don't own Route 66 that's ADOT and they're never going to approve it but we can't tell you that we just have no jurisdiction there but what 
really resulted was a really nice conversation with some youth participants where we talked a lot about how to get involved and how to get their art, you know, out to out to the people. And if they wanted to do a Black Lives Matter graphic, here were some ways that they could explore that. And I just don't think that's going to happen from the dais. I don't I don't think that we're going to have a conversation where we foster the artists <laughs> from the dais. Chris, did you have a comment? Uh, yeah, I, I can really go either way on this. Um, I really see what we do is really, really important. Um, and and to, to people on this commission, long before I got here, uh, you know, you drove the point home that art is an important part of what we do. Um, and staff has certainly done that. And there's a certain gravitas that comes with with holding the meeting uh, in in uh, the chambers that are designed to hold these kinds of meetings. But the other side of that, I really do see, you know, there's an informality, especially as as we try to encourage more artists to participate. That the conference room is is less intimidating. It's more for, less less formal. Wow, I, I see both sides of it. Matt, did you have a comment? Yeah, uh, thanks, Chair. I'll just say um, I prefer to meet when I don't have COVID uh, in the uh, the room that y'all are in right now. I really don't like the vibe of like I, I think of the high school kids coming to us and them standing below us and out, you know, for a for a, a beautification and action grant, stand below us, look up at us, and we'll pass judgment on you. It just doesn't feel right to me. So I strongly prefer. Uh, the more collegial atmosphere in the conference room. Thanks. Thank you, Matt. So I would agree too, and I would uh, make a motion that we keep the meetings in the staff conference room. Second. Thank you. Who would you like, Chair? Uh, Claire. Yeah. Cause, cause she's here. Um, <laughs> it's been moved and seconded to uh, keep the BPAC meetings in the staff conference room. All in favor say aye. Aye. Anyone opposed? Opposed. Anyone abstain? The motion carries and uh, we will be in the staff conference room. Thank you, folks. Moving forward to the discussion items. OK, I'm going to try to move through this one quickly. I know that we have to get to the beautification and action grants. Um, so. I know it's been a little bit of a while since you've heard about um, the three dimensional art project at the Murdoch Center. Near. Uh, near the Murdoch Center, I should say. It's at the Southside neighborhood or by the Murdoch Center. So, all right. So, just briefly, I'm going to go through these items from the background of the project, mm -hmm. a little bit about the vision and the outreach little bit about why we've had this delay and uh, show you the finalists. And so, oh, about a year and a half ago, um, Sarah Dector and Mark Revis were here with a CDBG grant idea uh, to improve the area around the Murdoch that would also include improvements to that little park parcel that's next to the Murdoch Center. We also had a couple of BIA grants approved for a new mural for a native plant garden to also help with this kind of project. And at that time, they were considering some fencing to delineate between the park and the Murdoch. And we thought we could add a little bit more money to the CDBG grant and maybe, you know, get some decorative plant panels. It was considered a fairly small project. You guys gave your authorization. The fence went away, so there was a change of scope. So we thought, well, let's put a little bit more money to it and let's see if we can get a small sculpture within that park. 
So um, it was originally a $20,000 project. The other thing that happened since uh, that is the prices of all materials went up substantially. So we we kind of, we just doubled it because all of our other projects were almost doubling in costs, including the library entry. So we just put it up to about $45,000 and thought maybe we could get a, a discrete sculptural experience. So we put a call out. It included all the historical background uh, of the area. Obviously, um, you know, this is, you know, right is next to the Murdoch. The Murdoch is its neighbor. It's a Black heritage site. It has a whole history of the Dunbar School, um, including they, you know, getting ahead of Brown versus Board of Education. First, there was segregation. The school was created, and then they were the first to desegregate. So then the school was no longer needed, and it became uh, ultimately, the Murdoch Center was shrunk in size when they widened Butler. There's a, you know, site has changed a little bit, but it's still a very important, uh, you know, part of this site. Um, presently, you know, that community center and Southside Community Association and Live Black Experience, you know, are are the neighbors, but it's also part of a, a, a bigger Southside area. You know, that includes the, you know, NAU and, you know, the expanded neighborhood and the, you know, all the uh, amenities on San Francisco. Um, so it has it has a lot of different um, areas that it addresses. Um, so this is the proposed art location. So it's right here in this. Uh, it's a proposed. There can be some other possibilities, but this is where Mark Rogas wanted to put it. Right in the center, there's a lovely tree, there's a rock, there are these light bollards. And I just kind of want you to note these light bollards a little bit because they kind of come into play, um, and, you know, about this project. And so this was the most obvious place that we thought, you know, thought because you could walk around the art, it wouldn't get in the way of any other facility, but that was before a little bit we knew that there was a water line underneath that's coming up. <laughs> <laughs> So, um, and, and this parcel is very interesting. It's not officially a park. Um, it is actually right of way. Um, so <laughs> there was a lot of confusion about what rules applied to this parcel, um, the, you know, because of that. Um, so we, as we got deeper and deeper into it, we uh, ran into some issues, but, you know, it's still a viable art location. Um, and this is a, just a little bit, you know, what, it might look like from Butler as you're driving by. If we had something, you know, about four feet high, you know, you might be able to see it. It wouldn't, there's no room for a monumental sculpture here. Most people want to save the tree if possible. Um, and so that's how we're going. So the vision was though it is a three-dimensional art piece of a human or smaller scale um, that's aspirational in its beauty and its contact. It also though, does need to take into the site that historical context because as you could see the you know the mural on the Murdoch Center uses its backdrop from a lot of the point of views so, so it cannot be a bad neighbor it has to be you know functional and incorporated in that so we did um, a lot of outreach for this uh, we actually particularly did some outreach to Los Angeles to try to capture more African American artists uh, than uh, reside in the immediate area um, because that we knew that would be important for the project. We are called to artists. Basically, we want five finalists. This is our process to be chosen out of the initial applicants. And that's just based on their past projects. Then each of these finalists will receive an honorarium of about $1,000 to produce a proposal. And then the selection panel is gonna reconvene and they're going to um, you know, look over the proposals and decide which one is best through a scoring process and a criteria. In between, the artists who are I'm showing you today on getting to those proposals, they will have a site visit that will include a, a, a meeting, a community meeting at the Murdoch Center, meeting with, um, all the people who are involved with that site so they can learn about all the restrictions of what they can and cannot do. <laughs> and um, and then also have a Mark Revis who will be giving them a historical walk around the South Side as well. Um, 
So this was the criteria though. They were judged upon their past work. So there was no proposals, you know, for this first phase. So again, we have the originality of their past work, how well their previous artwork complemented the site in which it was created to show that they had that ability. Um, also to be able to deal with public issues, the sensitivity, because this is the South side and there is sensitivities to this area. So we wanted artists to present that in their artist statements, how they, you know, the expertise that they have. And then also, you know, again, can they produce something that's highly durable, vandal resistant, and can stand up to Flagstaff's weather? So here are our selection panelists. Uh, as you can see, uh, we had Commissioner Garcia, we had Commissioner Vice Chair McCord, we had an um, artist that was recommended by Council Member Harris, we had some residents from the South Side, we had some people connected with ethnic studies from NAU, um, and we had, uh, you know, I first did ask actually um, Council Member Harris and uh, Council Member House. Um, even though that's unusual, but the, given the Murdoch, I extended that invitation, they declined. And so then we um, uh, drew upon uh, Dr. Carl Evans, who obviously uh, is a known, she grew up on the South Side and she's a former mayor and she's associated with the Sunnyside Community Association. So we did have some intervening events that kept us from scoring this for a little while. Um, we had travel and illness of one of the evaluators, and we decided to wait until the person recovered. We gave the extension to all the evaluators. Um, Dr. Evans submitted a letter of concern about the lack of historical focus and did not submit scores. And we have, um, I'll talk about how we've addressed uh, her letter of concern, but she won't because she didn't submit scores. Procurement rule says that she can no longer sit on the panel, and she's very aware of this and very comfortable with it. She knows the process. Um, her letter of concern, you know, she wanted something very much tied to the Murdoch Center. And um, there used to be an historical plaque that was told the history of the Dunbar School that was attached to the Murdoch Center. And when there was some exterior renovations done, the plaque disappeared. So one of the things that we are going to want to do to address that concern is it's now going to become part of the process to recreate an historical plaque and place it on the Murdoch itself. It will end up being a separate project, um, but we think it is really the right thing to do. And we're very comfortable as staff going forward with that suggestion. So um, we do have these water line and permitting issues. So we, I show you the, that bollard, you know, that those bollards have a cement foundation. Any cement foundation probably cannot be anything bigger than what supports those bollards. But um, basically, we, and we have to get within three feet of that water line, but there's still room to work <laughs> in that area. Um, there's also a few other areas in the park that we can go to. So, um, you know, our next steps will be uh, the, Artists have been notified. Um, we will get a site visit for them now within the next 45 days, now that these other issues have all been addressed. And then we will ask, we'll give them 60 to 90 days to produce proposals after that, because we want this to be thoughtful. And, you know, we don't have a strict timeline, so we might as well allow the artists all the time that they need, you know, to do these proposals. And then the selection panel will meet. And so I, I think maybe March, they'll have a proposal that, that comes back. We may take this to city council for a work session uh, as a courtesy, given the uh, importance of the site. So here's our finalists, Beth Nyback, Marie Jones, Daniel Moore, Chad Lefevre, and Ricardo Guthrie. So I just drew these comments, um, and I hope we had a chance to read them in detail when we sent the packets out. But this is one of the comments that came back from the selection panel. Um, you know, why the, one of the reasons that she was rated as high as she was. Um, her pieces, this, this is her past work. 
um, have a kind of a delight to them. Um, they do generally have also a night presence. Can I ask a question? Mm -hmm. Why was the process? Why was why was this process different than the previous process in terms of you selected artists based on like not seeing like why was your proposal submission different than the one for Archuleta Park? Just out of curiosity. Yeah. Well, generally, except for small projects, I don't like to ask for proposals. Um, without paying artists uh, for those proposals. That's a you know professional courtesy sure. and to uh, other professions. But because it's a temporary exhibition in the park and we were also soliciting known pieces, proposals made the most sense. Okay. Often like for the library entry, we just choose the artists on their past work. Right. And the proposal is then part of the whole design process. Right. So this is kind of a, a hybrid in between. And I tried to think of sites that maybe there is such vested um, community interest that people may want to see a proposal first. And so that's why I went ahead and did a two-step process for this one. It, it's a professional judgment. Um, so this is uh, the rest of Beth's work. Um, Reed Jones. Um, and so I think you know uh, Marie from obviously the work that she did at the courthouse. She's also a Southside resident. Marie's background has been in um, kind of text, art, and signage. So she's dealt with a lot of history before. I think that appealed to the panel. Um, Daniel Moore, I think, uh, you know, what really impressed, I remember from the panel, um, was how he showed in his artist statement a lot about his process and how he thought about sight. Obviously works in Cortez steel, which, as we know, is a very durable uh, material. A bit more abstract than the others. At times. And Chad Lefever. <laughs> is from Los Angeles. I think he's one of our few out-of-state artists, but very close by. Uh, he has a particular aesthetic. You won't see as much diversity in his approach. So um, you may, you know, get uh, something in within the same visual language. He also had a lot of working with community um, that I think impressed the uh, panel. And I don't think, I mean, we weren't sure if this was a proposal <laughs> for this or what, or if it was just an idea for another project. Um, and then the last one is Ricardo Godfrey, who obviously has done murals on the Murdoch and has been on the Southside Community Association board uh, for a number of years. Those are our five finalists. And our process going forward. Discussion, folks, any questions or comments? Well, the only thing that comes to the top of my mind is uh, I hate to belabor the point that you had too much 
face here, but it is so bad that Rose didn't decide to, to score her cards because it would have really changed the outlook of, or it could have changed the outlook of the artists that we had. But besides that, I, I was part of the process. It was a good, it, it, was a, it was a little bit of an interesting process because we were dealing with, uh, you know, a very, very uh, important cultural center for our South Side. And that's what made it interesting. And that's what's going to make the art that much more much dynamic, in my opinion. Yeah, it was, you know, like Anthony and um, Anthony for it's ease of moving in between communities here, but um, we actually sat and visited with um, some of the folks that spend their time in that park and relatively speaking, I mean, it's mostly unhoused people and um, they they really have a lot of you know, names for the rock and the tree. <laughs> wow. And that is their spot. It's, you know, and so one of the things that we were really trying to balance in the conversation is it is the Murdoch Center. Right next to it is a place that is an active space for our unhoused community. And so does the space belong more to the Murdoch, Murdoch Center or more to these citizens who are there every day? And how do you how do you have that conversation, you know, artistically? And and there is a sort of the interplay between what the piece is and the, the mural. And and there was a lot of, I think, a lot of thought about that. And Anthony and I certainly um, were really appreciative of the, the things that we learned from the individuals in the park. So um, and it was very nice to do that yeah. and visit with them. So, and, and just funny things, like they really like the shade from the tree. It's gonna yeah. be really hot without the shade from the tree. Um, so they, they impressed that upon me too. Please yeah, don't take the tree. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> the shade is so that's the thing we learned. The shade is really important. I mean, that's a that's a function of comfort and and the ability for people to be in that space. And so um, it was it was nice to get that perspective as well. And I I felt like maybe that perspective was missing a little bit from the um, many conversations. So I was grateful to have it. You know, just with the folks there. So, yeah, and, and it's interesting because when this project was first brought up, and I don't remember who it was that brought this up, but there was it was it wasn't framed in the context of let's push those people out. But as much as you felt what I just said, it was it was applied. Is how do we clean that park up? Get those people out of there. Yeah, and there that was kind of a vibe. I would agree with Anthony on that. So, and I, I think we have to be really careful and thoughtful about that because it's a, it's a space and a resource for our community members. So. Folks on the line, any questions or comments? I think you've got a lot of great artists on here. Your separation between number one and number two was what, four points? And and between number one and number five out of a total of more than 600 was still only 23. That's a, a lot of uh, a lot of good artists in close competition. Um, and and I do like uh, Beth Nybex, uh, the spirit of her art. I really like the giant head with uh, the writing and the fact that they light up at night. I thought that was. Yeah, really cool. And I like that it's gentle by, you know, it could be made dark sky compliant. There's there's some really nice things there. And um there was something too about a little bit of joy in her sculptures and, and if anything, bringing a little joy to that space, I think would be appropriate. Yeah. And plus if you can see it from the from the uh, you know, the butler. But each of these artists will have a chance. With their proposal, that yeah, it's a it's all a new process. Once they produce the proposal and uh, have the criteria, and uh, so that's why I want to give them plenty of time. Everyone, plenty of time to produce the best proposal that they can. It's nice not to have a construction timeline, um, <laughs> which to adhere to. 
<laughs> and I was like, artists, you have to have this in 30 days. <laughs> so, do you have any comments? I just I thought I think that it's a, a really great collection of artists and I'm excited to see what puts together. Any other final comments before we move forward to the BIA grant applications? Hearing none, we can move forward. Okay, so um, tonight I am here to report questions and concerns from all um, of you um, with regard to the beautification and action grant applications, all 10 of them this year. Um, <laughs> anyway, but it makes for a very long read. So yeah. <laughs> thank you all for, for going through them. Um, with that said, um, we're looking particularly for items that we want to let potential applicants know to prepare for, for their November presentation. So I don't have a PowerPoint this evening. Um, I'm just going to go through the list as I sent it to you um, via email. And if you took notes and have them with you, great. If you need a little reminder, give you a little reminder. But again, it's just um, comments, concerns, and questions um, each of the applications. So first up, we have the Bushmaster Park Community Fruit Orchard. So this is, you know, again, the, the objective is last time, you know, we had people presenting. Some of you had some, you know, big questions and we had to then bring the presenters back. We want to give them a chance to address your concerns up front. Um, so if Next question for staff. Um, are pros amenable to you know, maintenance and watering all that stuff? So we learned to go ahead and miss that in the that was my question for this one. They're in the budget, they have water hoses, but I didn't know if the water hoses were like ongoing or who is going to care for the trees on a, on an ongoing basis. It would be parks and rec, I would think. So you would like you would like that address in the presentation. Yeah. Yeah. Although we do have somebody from Gross here who may there this this group has been in contact with Pros and has already presented to the Parks yeah, and Rec right. Commission. Yeah. Would you like me to address it? Yes. Yeah. Um, I so the site that they're looking at can be irrigated. So that does help us with like the watering schedule. We're not going to be out there manually watering with hoses. Um, I think that would be a requirement for us is that it's irrigated. Um, we are already looking to add trees to this park. Um, and so this is kind of a, a win-win situation. Um, this is a little bit of an experiment for us as well, having the orchard trees be part of a park. But the, the space identified is was already identified um, as a community garden, so if it's, it's ready. I have another question about. So when I was thinking, when I when I read this, I was I was thinking about the apple trees in our yard. That you know, I think we have four that just litter the yard with apples, and we have to go pick them up and do something with them. So if there's uh, what was it, thirty eight fruit trees? If there's that many trees that are bearing fruit in terms of harvesting cleanup sort of that do we know what that work will look like it's a halloween breeding okay <laughs> <laughs> that was actually by um, one of the parks and recreation commissioners was because of the number of trees what is that going to look like and so i had um so i have in my notes address um harvesting in the november presentation so do, do they have a plan for that? Um, maybe if there's some public programming that could go along with that. They referenced a little bit in the presentation about maybe working with community groups during harvest season, but that needs to be fleshed out in more detail um, so that all of you um, have the information you need to then you know, prove the project or reject it. They could partner with uh, shelter services or the food bank or something. I mean, it seems like something that could be easily addressed if it's so okay so we will have them 
we will we will communicate to them to address that in their presentation in November. Yeah, I, I actually grew up in the Pacific Northwest, so like fifty percent of the trees in the parks are cherry and apple trees, um, and everybody just busts out the cider presses in the parks, and it's kind of just a thing. I I actually thought that was what he did at elementary school. It was <laughs> 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 so I grew up and then you go down and you catch the salmon and salmon and die. But um, anyway, uh, yeah, no, I mean, I, there's so much community stuff you can do with it. Um, you know, I did actually, used, I, I lived in Dolores for a long time and um, we had, Dolores, the, the valley there in town is just filled with orchard trees. And so I, I Kind of a key component of fall is the giant piles of apple filled bear poop that appear in your driveway. We are going to attract wildlife with this. And so I think just um, knowing that that's going to be a component, I think it's great to attract wildlife actually. It's awesome. But and, and we will see some, I think, some animals and things that are also very possible trees. So it'd be cool. And the last question I have, oh, go ahead. No, I was just going to say any other questions or comments, so please. The last question I had, and I think it might just, I, I may be remiss, but I have just looked over, overlooked it. Um, is there, a, like, in the placement of the trees, is there still going to be plenty of space for, like, kite flying and things like that? Based on the diagram, I thought. Yes. It, yeah, the diagram's included. Yeah, I mean, yeah, I, that's something. Thing, I, didn't, I don't remember. I got that's a good question I have. So he said, yes, so I'm good with that. Thank you. And they're way quieter than the question. Well, we just had to go. I don't have to. Oh, no. It's like to see in person, by the way. It might be a follow up. Absolutely. Um, but yeah, I'm not sure. I probably because I don't know if it's the email. I have a really long last name. <laughs> okay, <laughs> I'll, I'll check and make sure. And also, I mean, it was a pretty hefty file as well. So it might be okay. hanging out. Yeah, there's 52 pages. Yeah, that's okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, I'm sorry. And yeah. okay. yeah. yeah. me being new on here, I didn't uh, test you all You're if fine. I don't do it. You're <laughs> fine. Okay. Um, but I wonder, do they include anything um, or consider anything for storage for their equipment? It's not that off the that gets overlooked, but it's going to be really important in the community. Okay. Right? So it's, I don't think so. I'm pretty sure they did not, and okay. I will add that. Okay, thank you. That's important. Um, I just tried sending it to you, and it says unable to attach. I think it's because the file is so big. Okay. So, so I don't know. Yeah, I know. Is it possible that just for this one that we send it to the list? Of course, yeah. 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 So we yeah. Have, um, it's my my company. Yeah, I, I have it. it. Okay. Yeah. Great. Any more questions or concerns? Okay, nine more to go. Next one: dark sky brewing. Chris, oh. uh, never mind. Keep going. I'll wait until okay. uh to the right one. Okay. Um, dark Sky Brewing Beer Garden Mural. I love this. I thought it was super cute. I love the glow in the dark paint. Um, I think I think Dark Sky, I think they're great people in terms of how involved they are with the community. Um, I don't have any questions or concerns other than just I think it's a really cool idea. And this has already been vetted. In the space of this public enough, we're not going to run into that. Yeah, it's all public enough. <laughs> it's all visible from the street. Yeah. Very cool. My only concern was uh, the concern that I always bring up when it comes to these paintings on walls is you could literally see the pine tree in front of the painting of the pine tree. So I don't know if they could address that in any way, but I would appreciate it. <laughs> That was great. <laughs> and if you wanted a reference, um, Sky Black's piece is right around the corner. That's like real art, in my opinion. Well, and um, one comment that I did let them know is that they have to identify the artist. Um, I'm a, a pretty sure, based on the imagery, that um, I know who the artist is. Um, and she does work for them 
um, um, on their beer cans, <laughs> but they need to make that um, clear in their application. Yeah. Um, the NAU utility box lab. So a pilot project for NAU wrapping one of their utility boxes that was good. It's previously painted, but the paint is wearing off. And oh, go ahead. Yeah, go, go oh, ahead. And most likely, if you, if you approve this, it would be provisional approval because they do have an artwork process. So it's highly unlikely that that artwork will be um, determined by November. But any other comments, concerns, questions? We obviously see the hand of former Commissioner Zecker yes. <laughs> in this application. I have in my notes, I said um, we won't have final say in production because it's on the NAU campus, correct? What do you mean? I mean, it just seems like um, with with all the other reps, we get to have say because it's on city property, but this is on the NAU campus. And so all we're doing is approving the money to have this student. You you can you can still request to review the um, art proposal just as if it was um, here. So you can either have the approach of just approving the process and, and letting them go for their process, or you can approve um, the process, but also require that before the full funding is expended, that they bring the um, actual artwork proposal to you for your approval. You can do it either way. It's up to you. Does any of you have parents permit? What did you ask? I'm just if any has an arts and public art funding program for their campus. Um, it, it, it's a little. It's funny because. I think it's it's nice to be able to reach in and and have some interaction and at you and it's something that doesn't happen very much. Um, like the new master plan is is really all about the edges of the community. Like how how does the city and the how do the city and the and the university interact? Which they really don't do. I guess they're, they're kind of two islands. Um, so for political reasons, I I kind of feel like this is a good opportunity to just kind of make nice from an arts. Thing, but I just want to make sure that we're not going to run into like a conflict with an arts program or somebody who's on the NAU campus that's like, oh, wait, what? <laughs> they got approval from uh, facilities who uh, manages, takes care of, who's mm -hmm. in charge of the box. I think um, they have a College of Arts and Letters. They have all kinds of programs, but I don't think that the University Arts and Letters program would do public art on campus. I think there's sort of like two different things. And I think it's facilities that sort of pays for things like this. Okay. Um, I think politically it's probably a nice thing to support. I do support it. I do support it, but I was thinking um, if they could use their own process as far as jurying, I, I think they, they could use, I don't know, um, maybe their art department to come up with some ideas and kind of alleviate some stress in Janet. Yeah, that's in the proposal that they're going to have their own committee. Okay. No, it's just you you can decide whether or not you want to approve their recommendation or not. And you don't have to. It's up to you. And that'll be in November. I sort of want to just because we see all the other wraps before they're wrapped. Um, mm -hmm. But I don't want to micromanage the creative process either. And so, I don't know, I just think you know, maybe I'm just spoiled at being able to see all of the <laughs> wraps before they go on. But, you know, certainly I'm not on a selection panel yeah. for every single wrap. So as long as they're in compliance, we don't end up just waiting for other jacket advertising. Um, which we might if we don't get final approval. Which, I mean, that's the thing is we may want to just get a review thing so that we don't end up with something like um, a previous sports mural that I feel like was pretty poorly executed. So, um, mm -hmm. just to avoid all of a sudden finding out that it's a recruitment ad. <laughs> well, then, then require a review. Yeah. And we can, it's great. We can, I was looking at their budget, and there was like a certain amount we could expend so that they could do the prep work and, mm -hmm. and all that. And then we can hold the rest of the money until 
you know, the approval of the, the actual piece. Well, we're not, uh, we don't need to vote on an approval because this is just a discussion item. Are we just going to let them know that we want to approve the art or yeah. how do we? The, the purpose of today is for you to give us questions and concerns that we can give to the presenters and the, the approvals are all in November. But we want any of your questions and concerns to be relayed to them before they present so that we can have a cleaner process when we have our presenters here. Okay. So the approvals are in November. Okay. Chris? Any comments from folks online? Oh, not yet this one. <laughs> the next one is the historic train rail bench by artists. Um, Randy Gray and team. Um, and I do have on this, and I have told Randy this as well, um, the location needs to be determined and permission is needed to for this. Right. That was one of my comments. Yeah, so if they don't have a location and permission by the November meeting, it won't be presented. Hmm. This was one too where I wondered if we would be able to sort of look at the design. I mean, I saw the chess, the chess board. And then, you know, I saw the design for the bench. I don't know, it would just be nice to sort of see furniture that's created with train tracks. I, I would think we'd need to see that. Hmm. Just an overlay it. Mm -hmm. So, do we want to require that the same as we are with NAU's final design? I kind of feel like we should ask them to come back with a location before it's accepted as a BIA grant. Yeah, that's what she's saying. They will. I already said that. Yeah. But I mean, that, that is, I just feel like without that, it's right. It won't be presented to you if they don't have a okay. location okay. information. Okay. Not sure what you said. Oh, absolutely. Okay, moving on, we have the Wildflower Meadow Maze, um, Friends of Willow Bend Gardens, and this would be installed at the Willow Bend Environmental Education Center. I love this. My comments were cheap and engaging, and my question was, what about upkeep? I think this was only 850 bucks, right? Yeah, I think they were just asking for materials. Right. This was the one also I asked about upkeep. Um, they've been a pretty good steward of all the land that they come and receive from us since like 2017. So I'm pretty sure that they have, I mean, I'm just judging off the past, they take care of it. Well, we could just have them present upkeep in their presentation. Sure. Yeah, I don't think that was included in the proposal. Mm -hmm. But I love the idea. I love the rendering of uh, one of the mazes. There we go. Okay, hey, the next one is the Flagstaff Family Food Center Community Garden. And then they're also um, proposing a mural in conjunction with FALA. Of course, we know that the mural artwork needs to be finalized um, and presented in ideally in November. Otherwise, it would go to provisional, a provisional approval. Are there any other questions that you would like answered for the November presentation? I said I thought it was a good idea. Um, I like the community involvement. and They did a really good job in terms of using sources, community sources in terms of uh, donations of just all kinds of things to help with this project. Uh, I just had good feedback. I didn't have any questions. And just as an aside too, I'm asking all um, applicants to make sure to include images of the location. Um, and if there's a particular wall or garden area, we need photos of that as well to orient all of you um, to what is being proposed. And Chris and Matt, if you guys have something to say or ask, um, just jump in or raise your hand. I am looking at the screen and I know Craig is too. Next up is the Sunny Side Up Sunflowers in Bloom project. Um, I related to Dr. Evans that they will need the name of an artist by um, presentation. Um, and also, we've asked for photos. They will also need to supply photos of the location, the proposed location. Um, without that, 
it would be a provisional potential provisional approval, um, but it would not receive formal approval without finalized our rules. But I do know that they have a community process to create that sunflower in your own. So we wouldn't be able to give final approval, even though it's a community, like, because her part of her thing is that it is a community process. Right. You guys can approve the process, or you can say a provisional. Oh, okay, but we could just approve it with the process. Yes, you could. The questions I had for this one were, there wasn't really much info in the proposal about the, the QR code process. So of course I was thinking about costs. And so I, my questions were like, who will record the information that's played with the QR code? Will it be free? When will it be, where will it be stored? Um, I don't know how hard drives and all of that stuff goes, works, but I didn't see any information about like maintenance costs. So or those are good questions to make sure that she answers in her presentation. I, I, I actually worked with her a little bit on this to help her develop it. It's actually going to drive to a website. So the maintenance is pretty low. Um, and that website would contain further art, further experiences. Because the idea is it's supposed to be a physical piece that drives people to interact with the community. That's really what her goal is with it. And so she's wanting people to come into the piece, see this community involvement, and then go in and interact with the community. So but she's got to convey that. Is it an existing website? Or um, will it be a new website? I like, think it's going to be something new. She's got a, like her Sunnyside website, but I don't even think that's functional. So it would just be a new, a new site. So Carla, how would you be able to convey the message to her that if you weren't in the room, well, no, I mean, I, I, I think that's Kristen. They got that. Kristen's doing because like a key you know, the like a professional. She asked me for some advice on meeting some BIA things because she had some stuff in the grant that wasn't appropriate in her first draft. Um, because it was, it, it included marketing and stuff for the piece, and so that we can't pay for. Um, but do you have any specific um, things to? Well, no, consider? but I think just just making sure that that. The she talks about that stuff. conveys what where it's going to go and and what's going to be contained on the site is yeah. important. These websites have to be kept up. You know, you're going to have someone need to record the voiceover. Yeah. If links go down, there has to be maintenance. I mean, websites are a pain. I think I think her intention is for it to be hosted by the Southside Community Association, um, which has been around for like a decade or two. Right? I, yeah. So I think that we need to let. Her answer in the presentation, but we need to yeah. let her know the concerns and questions. Right. So that because it's not appropriate for me to answer those questions right. for her. Right. Okay. Mm -hmm. Next up is the Little Free um, Little Free Library Sunnyside, um, and then just real quick, a few updates. Um, Stephanie Washington has received four um, approvals for site locations: Hope Cottage, Hal Jensen Recreation Center, Family Food Service. And then the corner of her property, which is quite large, she's on the she's on the corner of First and is it Police, um, and that's an update from Stephanie. Right, I was going to say uh, location approvals were missing. Yes, <laughs> so that was a thing. Uh, I know that uh, Kristen, you also questioned whether she was just going to paint them yellow or whether she was going to include artwork on them, and what was the response? Correct. To that? I had um, asked her if she would be interested in. Um, you know, seeking um, an artist to create some original artwork for the life or for the little libraries. Um, she was resistant to that. Um, she said she would keep it in mind, but she really wanted to paint them bright yellow and have them located um, in and around Sunnyside. Chris, do you have something to say? Yeah, this is the one I have the question on. The question is simple. Uh, these things are the most cute, adorable things you'd ever see in a city. But my question is, how often are they actually used? I use them. I use them. I walk huh? around. I put, I put, I put in books and take out books all yeah. the time. So. Yeah. <laughs> You're asking the wrong person, Chris. <laughs> 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 the ones in my neighborhood, they change all the time. And I will say we work a lot with um, DBA and DBA, um, one of our um, staff, city staff, um, who works also with DBA is constantly going over to the Flagstaff City Coconino County Library and getting those free books 
and is continually replenishing the libraries um, in downtown proper, which I just learned about. So but she does that. So There's one in my neighborhood that's a great source for very saucy, like, <laughs> we'll, we'll, we'll paint that one neon purple. A lot of heaving in that box. <laughs> what I like, what I liked about this one was that that there's I didn't realize that there's a network online of little libraries and they like show the locations of these things. So if somebody is a real little library enthusiast, they can go online and, and find the locations. And so it would it would network uh, the Sunnyside neighborhood with that larger network and just provide opportunities for people to give and get books. Um, I like this one. I didn't have any questions really. I also just happened to get Stephanie's right into the Omnidge program for FUSD, and she's very dedicated to this kind of thing. And was an FLP last me last year, and I think she would probably really stick to this. I'm sure after your picture. Yeah. yeah. Very inspired by the Quinn Payton show. Oh, <laughs> and wanted to do something. She's one of my reliable <laughs> waters. <laughs> wanted yeah. to do something else. Um, Glad handy. Okay, the next no, one is really the Texas funny. Roadhouse Utility Box Wrap. I've um, informed the artist that um, artwork has to be finalized by the November presentation. Can we get approval for this too? I didn't like the artwork. Yeah, that, that mm -hmm. we, we told this artist that because he, we won. Because he's an artist applying, yeah. you know, that it's appropriate for a, a, a actual proposal. Okay. No. Folks online, any questions or comments? This one is the Canyon Colors collaboration between Molly Keen Art, M3F, and Habitat for Humanity. And that is for the large mural, also in Sunnyside. Love all these Sunnyside projects. Yeah, I just said yes for this. I don't have any questions or comments. Yeah. yeah. I like it. Yeah. They already have a specific proposal, so go period. Okay, no questions for them? Okay, I'll just let them present. Thank you. So moving forward, our two from items. City staff. None. Chair Cruz, none. Uh, other than I'm looking forward to Tucson. Thank you um, and Phoenix. Thank you staff for putting that together. And uh, I'm sure that will be a neat opportunity to interact with our arts people to the south. Uh, City Council liaison. Commissioners, additional two from items. Anyone have something to say? Folks on the line? Hearing none, uh, request for future agenda items. Hearing none, date and time for our next meeting is Monday, November 13th at 4 p.m. Uh, in the staff conference room on the second floor of City Hall. And uh, I will adjourn the meeting at 6.20. Thank you, everybody. Yeah, thank you for hanging in. I know it was a big agenda today. We were through it. It was a fun. Matt and I will feel better soon. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> so, you want to know the location of the Harlequin? <laughs> <laughs>